My guest today is Congressman David Kustoff, who represents Tennessee's 8th Congressional District. Congressman, welcome to the show. You're very kind to have me. I appreciate being here. Well, we always appreciate having members of Congress here at The Daily Signal. I'd like to talk with you today specifically about a very important topic that I feel like really doesn't get a lot of press these days, which is this kind of rise in anti-Semitism in America. So to start off, is anti-Semitism on the rise in America? Yeah, it it, it definitely is. And you know, I, I've got a unique perspective because I'm I'm a Jewish member of Congress, one of two Republican Jewish members in the House of Representatives, and um, we see it. You don't have to be Jewish to see it. Um, you know, you, you think about the the very start of this this year, the situation in Colleyville, Texas, which uh, was clearly anti-Semitic, was clearly um, a hate crime, mm. and I think it's symbolic, if you will, of what we've seen the last the last several years. Unfortunately, I think some of it is, is driven right here in, in Washington mm. because when you have when you have leaders on the on the primarily on the other side of the aisle that talk about this, uh, whether it's an aside or or what have you, people pay attention. Mm. Not only people here, but people Around the world, so the the statistics demonstrate, and they and and they definitely show that anti-Semitism is is on the rise. It's on the rise here. It's on the rise around the world, and we've got to be serious about about ways to combat it. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned that there are members of the other side of the aisle, specifically, I think we can refer to them as the squad. Uh, Democrats Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar specifically have been accused on various occasions of making anti-Semitic comments. So I guess I want to start off with how do you feel when your colleagues make statements like that? It's very difficult. Uh, I mean, you know, first of all, we're here. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be attacking anybody based on their race, religion, ethnicity, what have you. Especially as leaders. Hmm. And if I can pull back for a moment, because because one thing that I've learned to appreciate, and I'm, I'm five years as, as a United States representative in my, in my third term, my words matter. Hmm. Uh, what a what a congressman or senator says or does or demonstrates matters and it gets magnified. And so if you take it out of the realm of the United States, the, the rest of the world, you have a member of Congress that makes anti-Semitic remarks, makes remarks about uh, the significance of Israel, uh, Israel's right to exist, and they make it in a negative way, well, Around the world, they're looking at this this beacon of democracy that we have in Washington, and uh, they see that if a if a member of Congress can say something like this, then it must be resonating. Now, it may be isolated, and and I'm not throwing a blanket over uh, any political party because there there are certainly uh, those leaders in the Democratic Party who condone all of this. Mm-hmm. But um, the fact of the matter is, is that when you have members who say some of the things that that uh, some of their members say, people pay attention and 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 it and it gains some resonance around the world. I think that's such a fascinating thing that you just said, where what you say as a representative matters not just here but around the world. What type of message do you think it sends both to Americans at home? And to people who are looking to America, possibly in Israel, possibly in Europe, who are thinking, "Well, what is this woman saying? Why are they saying these things that are so anti-Semitic?" Well, for the vast majority of people, I think it angers them uh, and and uh, and and aggravates them at the at the same time that that people can make anti-Semitic remarks, cast it aside as however they want to uh, however they want to label it, and essentially. Get away with it. Uh, for, the, for the overwhelming majority of Americans, this is not what they want to see out of out of Washington D.C. For the rest of the world, who uh, some of whom may or may not understand our our system of government, uh, but you know, you, when when and I'm talking about Israel. When you when you talk about a, a a nation that that hasn't been in existence 
very long in the grand scheme of things, 1948, and there are legitimately people around the world who question Israel's right to exist, Mm -hmm. then that type of talk from members of Congress plays into the, 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 the very notion of whether Israel has a has a right to exist and, and to protect herself and and her citizenry. And so that to me is what um, is what's concerning. We don't you know, free speech is free speech. Mm. And and people have a right to say what they want to say, especially the four hundred and thirty five elected members of the House of Representatives and the one hundred members of the Senate. Mm-hmm. But words matter. Mm. Um, I think about that every time I'm giving a speech, making remarks, issuing a, a, a statement, that words definitely matter. And uh, as leaders, and I think everybody here who's an elected member, there's certainly a leader. You've got a responsibility to lead appropriately and correctly. Absolutely. One specific incident that I want to get your view on is in February and in March of 2019, when Congresswoman Omar made statements that were widely condemned by anti-Semitic. The response in the House was to draft up a resolution, and that resolution became more and more watered down until it was a sort of generalized statement against hate as a concept. I guess it seems so odd to me that they couldn't just come out and say anti-Semitism is a problem. Why do you think that was? Yeah. Well, if, if I can, I'm going to give you a little bit of background because this is uh, this is truly a decision that um, – and a vote that I really had to, had to think about. So you're exactly right. Uh, at, at that point in time in 2019, the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives. So, so they, they get to decide what comes to the floor and get, gets voted on by, by me and the other congressmen – and what doesn't? And so when those remarks were made by a member of Congress, we were hearing talk that there was going to be some type of statement, some type of resolution coming from the entire House of Representatives that was going to condone anti-Semitism. Mm. And uh, the vote was going to come up, I believe it was on a, on a Thursday. And I remember talking to members of my staff because we had not seen we had not seen the actual uh, resolution that we were going to be voting on, and literally about thirty minutes before the vote, we got the text, and I, I predicted that it would be watered down to uh, condone a bunch of things, not solely anti-Semitism, which was the mm-hmm. reason that so many Republicans and Democrats were were mad about these anti-Semitic remarks. Uh, but it would it would include everything. So I'm I'm literally walking to the floor, and I'm thinking, well, surely. I mean, we everybody everybody abhors uh, statements made uh, against uh, 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 about racism, mm. racist remarks, um, certainly anti-Semitic remarks. But this was supposed this vote, <laughs> this resolution was supposed to be only about anti-Semitism. And uh, and I made the decision. I, I voted. I voted for the resolution, mm-hmm. which which talked about that the, all all these types of statements against anybody for race, religion, what have you, were uh, completely unwarranted. But it was absolutely watered down by Nancy Pelosi and and the Democratic leadership, so that they could make sure to get the votes of those on the far far left mm-hmm. that. Um, that unfortunately, I think say things that uh, about about Jewish people and about the state of Israel that shouldn't be said by a member of Congress. Absolutely, I want to move on to an incident that you alluded to briefly at the beginning of this interview, which was that shooting at the synagogue in Texas, which was just horribly tragic, and our hearts go out to those people who lost lives and lost loved ones in that incident. But I guess this is something that happens in America. And I guess, what is the American response to it? What does Congress do to make sure these things don't happen? Well, a number of things. One is the type of talk that we've been talking about throughout this interview, that cannot happen, Mm. (laughs) neither on the floor of the House of Representatives or from a member of Congress. Because again, if, if a member of Congress makes those types of statements, that feeds into that mentality. Mm. And in a way... 
this may not be the right term, but it becomes acceptable. Mm. And uh, and we've got to push back on that. And so in my opinion, and go back to 2019 for a moment, uh, maybe that member should have been disciplined. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we've been talking about a resolution. Maybe they should have been disciplined. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe the response is, I mean, I'm, I'm going to play the what if game. Let's say that that my party, the Republican Party, takes back the House of Representatives in November of 2022. Mm. There's been a precedent sent by the, the Democrats this term to remove Republican members from certain committees. Mm. Well, you've got one member that you've, you've talked about who's on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Right. Maybe she doesn't deserve or or, is, or or shouldn't be placed on that committee. So if Republicans take back the House of Representatives, uh, maybe if, if you made anti-Semitic remarks in the in the past, you shouldn't serve on a committee dealing with foreign affairs. Mm-hmm. And that sends a signal. The other thing I think we have to do for exactly the reasons that you cited is we've got to give law enforcement, federal, state, and local, the tools and the resources that they need to combat anti-Semitism. Mm. And, and these crimes, they need to be prosecuted very vigorously, my opinion, by federal officials. Do you think that's happening at the moment? Um, I think there's a lot more that can be done. And I, I again, talk about Collegeville. I think it was apparent to anybody that was following the news that day that uh, it was based on the anti-Semitism and it was a hate crime. Mm-hmm. The president, when he made his initial remarks, wouldn't go there, mm-hmm. wouldn't condone it as a as a hate crime and anti-Semitic. And later on, he did. Uh, we, the, the president has the the power of the bully pulpit, mm-hmm. and whoever the president is, they've got an obligation, especially as it relates to what happened in Colleyville, to call it out for what it is. And he didn't do it immediately. And uh, and I think that's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to follow up on something you said a little bit earlier. You said that there has been a precedent set by the opposition party, uh, the Democrats, to uh, remove members from committees if they feel like they've right. done something wrong. Are you saying you would be maybe if in favor uh, if the Republicans were to retake the House of using that strategy on on Ilhan Omar or other members of Congress who have made yeah. anti-Semitic statements. Well, look, I mean, the Democrats have set the precedent to to do that, uh, rightly or, or I, I think wrongly. I, it's always been in the purview of uh, whatever party you're in for for the leadership, if you will, to to assign committee assignments. Mm. And the the Democrats, for the first time in our history, have removed Republican members from committees. Um, You didn't ask me this. If I I were in the Democratic leadership, number one, I never would have put some of the people on, the the person on, the the member on the committee in the first place. And secondly, after she made the comments, I would have have stripped her of the Mm -hmm. the committee assignment. And – Neither of those things happened. So I think now that the the Democrats have laid down the gauntlet, uh, they've given Republicans, if in fact we uh, take back the majority in the House this year, which I think we will, Mm. to uh, look at the Democrats' committee assignments. Absolutely. One of the things that I'm curious, too, as your role as a representative is that legislation is such a crucial part of what you do. So let's say you are given the opportunity to to draft legislation to say anti-Semitism is a focus. Here's how we can legislatively combat it. What do you write down? Yeah. Well, in fact, I, I did do that in my, in my very first term. Um, we, we worked on a bill that, that was passed uh, almost not quite unanimously in the House and the Senate, but almost – that uh, that made it a felony to attack a religious place of uh, of worship, mm. whether it's a church, synagogue, mosque. I'm not talking about the people. I'm talking about the the the, the structure. Um, it was not a felony before. Interesting. You call uh, you call whomever, and you say I'm I'm going to blow up this church or this synagogue. Before this law was passed, the uh, that I sponsored in 2017, uh, it was not a felony mm. 
today that's a that's a felony. I I'm a former United States attorney, was the chief prosecutor for my area in West Tennessee. I used all the tools in my toolbox to go after the the bad guys. The the bill that I just talked about that became law that President Trump signed is a tool the prosecutors can use to go after these uh, these bad guys to in mm. fact to make it to make it a felony. So I I think right now there are uh, there there are good laws on the books that law enforcement can use and our and our federal prosecutors to go after these people and they they need to be directed by the Department of Justice mm. to do that. So right now as we sit here today with with the Biden administration and the House and the Senate in Democrat hands the the attorney general needs to be empowered mm. to use all these tools to to do it. If there's uh if there's divided government in 2023, a Democrat in the White House, Republicans controlling either the House and or the the Senate to make sure that the administration does use those tools and if the attorney general or the US attorney come to me and say congressman why don't we look at at doing this to combat anti-semitism mm. then then I'm certainly going to I'm I'm going to work on legislation to try to accomplish that sure now was there bipartisan support when you passed that bill in your first term yeah and and I I'm very proud about that because there there was bipartisan support. Uh, you know, just like anything else, as you can imagine, when you work on legislation, mm-hmm. it's not always clean, and 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 you go back and forth on on language. And as, my point is, it's not easy. Maybe right, it shouldn't right. be easy, but but it's not. There was bipartisan support, uh, not unanimous support, but mm-hmm. but uh, but bipartisan support to to get it done. And I'm. And, and we had good bipartisan co-sponsors. I, I do want to make that absolutely clear right. because there were uh, there were there were Democratic co-sponsors and Republican co-sponsors of that bill. Do you feel as if, say, in 2022, you were to reintroduce something similar to that, it would receive the same amount of bipartisan support? You know, I do. Uh, again, we don't want to throw a, a blanket over everybody in the in the other party and say that they've feel the way that some of these members do that you you referenced earlier because there are plenty mm-hmm. that do not and uh my opinion is they're stifled some of those democratic members by their own leadership um those th- those few have an outsized voice and unfortunately their voice is louder than 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 likely the majority in their party. Absolutely. One of the things we've also discussed a little bit is Israel and how the state of Israel is a frequent target of anti-Semitic attacks. So my question I always ask about this is, is it acceptable to criticize the state of Israel and not make it anti-Semitic? Is that a possibility or is all criticism of Israel anti-Semitic? Well, at least the criticism I've, I've seen, it, uh, it, it, Lends itself to anti-Semitism, mm. I, th- w- at least what we've heard, what we've heard recently, and you know I've had the, I've had the opportunity, if you will, to to go to Israel on a on a bipartisan trip, like a lot of other members of of Congress, and this goes a little bit beyond what you just asked me, and I think people listening can understand this. It's one thing to um, to to read the news, to see the news. To do your own research about what's happening in a certain part of the world, it's another thing to go there and visit mm. and talk to officials and uh, kick the tires, if if you will. And I think that the the people who uh, in this country who have not had the opportunity to, to to visit Israel might not be able to appreciate from a from a size perspective um, how how small, if you will, and surrounded Israel is by its neighbors mm. and and how close some of the bad actors are to the the, the borders of, of Israel. And so you've got, you know, the, the converse of it is, is that if, God forbid, if, if, if Israel ceased to exist, failed to exist, mm. you've lost democracy in the in the Middle East. Um, and then, and then it becomes uh, it becomes a 
a conflict, a huge conflict that ultimately um, this country gets further engaged in. So we've got a duty to protect Israel. We've got an obligation to protect Israel. And the uh, at least in the last several years that I've seen, I don't think anybody paying attention to the news, the criticism, if there is criticism of Israel, it is either anti-Semitic or directly leads to anti-Semitism. On a similar topic, what are your views? Excuse me. What are your views on the BDS movement, the boycott, divest, sanction movement? Yeah, uh, and that's you, you know, that's something that's been debated on the on the floor of the House of Representatives also, and and that um, the Democratic leadership has had to has had to push back on. And I think it's unfortunate that we're we even have to talk about it mm. in this nation, but but it exists. It's uh, it's a minority. But the, the longer the minority gets to talk about it, my concern is that, uh, that you have other people who begin to, to latch on to it. And, and certainly that's, that's dangerous to, to Israel as well. Sure. So Congress's role with our relationship with Israel, where do you see our governments, our congressional governments' rep- or, um, relationship with Israel going? You know, um, if you go backwards – to the Trump administration, my opinion, President Trump is the strongest president that uh, that uh, United States president that that Israel has, has known, uh, and certainly President Trump was very committed. I go back to about two months before the the 2020 election. I was I was on the White House lawn for the signing of the Abraham Accords, mm. and there were two thoughts that that. I was thinking about as as these documents were being signed, Israel, UAE, Bahrain. Number one is it was truly historic. Two, I'm not sure that any other president other than Donald Trump could have gotten it accomplished by who he was, the force of his personality, all those things. Sure. And and I really applaud President Trump uh, and, and Jared Kushner and everybody that – that work to to get that done. By the same token, again, if if you're in another part of the world and you saw that and you saw the United States commitment to Israel then mm-hmm. and you compare it to now, I think you probably question the the United States commitment on on some level. There are certainly strong congressional leaders uh, who uh, who will who advocate uh, the strong support of, of Israel, but you don't see that level coming from the from the administration for whatever reason, sure. and that concerns me. Mm. Well, let's follow up on that topic. What is America's role in fighting anti-Semitism around the world? Well, we should lead. <laughs> mm. We should lead in fighting anti-Semitism. We're the world's greatest democracy. People around the world look to us to see as they experiment with democracy in their nations, um, what works, mm. and we've got to continue to, to lead. So and when you talk about leading, you're talking about from the, from the administration, whoever's president, and at the, at the congressional level. And at the administrative level, they do not seem to be as fully committed um, as – uh, as the Trump administration, mm. at least that's the that's the perception that that other people around the world have. But we've got to be the absolute leader in in, in fighting anti-Semitism. And what does that look like? Well, it it looks like uh, it looks like words and actions. Mm. Um, it looks like making sure that uh, that we continue to work with Israel on peace accords like the Abraham Accords. It looks like that we fund uh, Iron Dome to the extent that um, that Israel needs funding. You know, it was just not a, a year ago that Israel had hundreds and thousands of of rockets fired upon it uh, by by enemies, mm. and the Iron Dome protected Israel. Mm. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we we support it. We had this debate about funding. The Iron Dome just several months ago, mm. and 
The overwhelming majority of Republicans supported it. The I think the majority of Democrats supported it, but you had you had a loud minority mm-hmm. that opposed it. So when it, when you see that debate and you're in another country about whether the United States wants to help Israel uh, fund and um, and be able to employ Iron Dome, what do you think? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now that's rhetorical, but but what do you think? And I think that I think the answer is explanatory. Right. Well, I want to follow up on that because those all sound like supporting Israel. Is there other things that America should be doing to fight anti-Semitism more generally across the globe? Like I lived in France for quite a long time and there was a lot of anti-Semitism against Jews in Paris. Does America have a responsibility to address those types of issues, not just in Israel, but around the globe? Well, we, we've got to look, we've got to be able to uh, to defend. We've got to be able to talk loudly and condone those types of actions if if Certainly, if they're in the United States and in and in other parts of the world, uh, I, wherever you fall on the issue, um, if you're listening, can you imagine a world without without Israel as we know it today, mm-hmm. <laughs> and what that does to peace and security in the Middle East, and what that does to peace and security in the United States? Um, you know, we are um, been hearing a lot about uh, as, as we just uh, memorialized if you will the 75th uh, the 75th anniversary of the of the ending of, of World War II um, and the Holocaust and and um, we cannot forget what happened <laughs> we cannot forget what happened then we also need to remember that anti-semitism has has existed for a long long time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it may never completely go away, but unless our leadership, and I'm a leader, unless we uh, we work to protect those who are subjected to anti-Semitism, it will continue to exist, and uh, and it will perpetuate. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous to everybody. Before we wrap up, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there was an incident in the nation's capital very, very recently at Union Station where a twice deported legal immigrant spray painted swastikas all over the building. How does it make you feel when you see swastikas in the nation's capital so brazenly displayed on one of our our buildings? A lot of emotions. uh, Angry disappointed, sad, bewildered, all wrapped up into one. And I think that's probably the way a lot of people a lot of people think and a lot of people feel. Um, the fact of the matter is and that illustrates it. Anti-Semitism continues to exist. It continues to perpetuate. And you know we've we've got these battles. <laughs> uh, whether it's on social media involving free speech and what is the right balance where where do you where do you land mm. but unless we aggressively talk about and against anti-semitism it's going to continue to to grow in this nation and other places in the, in the world uh i i was elected in 2016 to congress same year donald trump was elected and the one thing that we know about Donald Trump was he spoke very loudly, and, <laughs> and you never had to guess where he was on any given issue. He spoke very loudly about anti-Semitism and about uh, about Israel's right to exist and and our relationship with with Israel. And this president needs to speak with the same force, the same authenticity, mm. in order to combat it. At least it at least in the year 2022. Absolutely. That was Congressman David Kustoff, who represents Tennessee's 8th Congressional District. Congressman, it was a pleasure having you on. Thank you. For, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. 